Now, all Philoctetes events, if you go to philoctetes.org, they're all listed on our calendar. And like this particular event, they're all simulcast. They're all archived. So if you, if you, if you can't see the simulcast, you can, a few days later, go to philoctetes.org to past programming, see the past event. And they're also all on YouTube where they, for, for, for your information, receive hundreds of thousands of hits, actually, in total, all of our programs. Um, and it's sort of extraordinary which programs receive the most hits. Like, we did one called 500, uh, 500 Years of Violin, Five Centuries of Violin Making. It's received thousands of hits. Uh, it's, it's just odd. And certain other programs you thought, you thought might have received a tremendous amount of hits don't. It's, it's interesting what the, the minds of interest, of specialized interest that people have. And that's a little bit what we're about here at Philoctetes in terms of make meaning making and finding areas of interest that people might not normally have been uh, thought were part of the human imagination. Now, uh, lastly, we depend on you for support. We have received a number of grants from the Department of Cultural Affairs, from Bloomberg, numerous foundations, but we need the support of all fil- people who come to Philoctetes because the grants we receive are, tend to be program oriented. so keep us in mind in terms of your gift giving. I'm now pleased to present Jane Ira Bloom. Jane Ira Bloom is a soprano saxophonist, composer, and pioneer in the use of live electronics and movement in jazz. She is the winner of the 2007 Guggenheim Fellowship in Music Composition, the 2007 Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Award for Lifetime Service to Jazz, the Jazz Journalists Association Award, and the Downbeat International Critics Poll, the soprano saxophone, and the Charlie Parker Fellowship for Jazz Innovation. Bloom was the first musician commissioned by the NASA Art Program and has an asteroid named in her honor by the International Astronomical Union. She has received numerous commissions and has composed for the American Composers Orchestra, the St. Luke's Chamber Ensemble, and the Palabalus Dance Theater, integrating jazz performers in new settings. She has recorded and produced 13 albums of her music and holds degrees from Yale University and the Yale School of Music Bloom is currently on the faculty of the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music in New York City. Her latest release is the award-winning Mental Weather. And, and this particular panel was a little bit inspired by your um, the Pollock CD that we listened to, Chasing... Mm-hmm. Chasing Paint. Chasing Paint. So uh, that's another one mm-hmm. people should think about. Yes. Take it away, Jay. Yes, CDs. Uh, will there for be sales. CDs on yes, sale? there will be. Yes. And are we selling any of the <laughs> posters? The, uh, gen- there'll be posters of those... Posters based upon that element, the Janine Menlove posters. Uh, We have posters for sale by Janine Menlove afterwards. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Here we go. Thank you. 
Welcome. We figured we'd start with, with doing rather than talking. <laughs> can, you, can you see what's going on visually uh, by looking at the screen? I guess it's, it, you have mixed, mixed views because you want to watch the performer, but there's also the performance going on. Um, I'll just, just quickly, uh, uh, so honored to have uh, really world-class artists, musicians uh, joining us today with illustrious careers that if I, if I read them all, uh, I think everybody has a program. Uh, but let me just take a moment to introduce uh, painter Vicky Barenguet, is that correct? <laughs> uh, who uh, will talk a little bit about her work. Uh, and uh, Gustavo Casaneve, huh? <laughs> multi-instrumentalist Marty Ehrlich on uh, bass clarinet today and painter Rebecca Allen. Uh, I've done just about everything in this place that I can think of. We've had dancers in here. I was just talking to Ed. We've done just about everything. But what, uh, I came up with this idea bec uh, basically because for years and years, I've always composed with uh, imagery, visual imagery. On, on, I like to play, you know, sit at the piano and compose. And I've always been a visual thinker. And Noticed that uh, other musicians too had a great affinity for music that had some impulse from a visual world compelling it, it or joining it. And likewise, I've met painters who have talked to me often about uh, how they must paint with music, to music, for music. Um, one, one association I personally had in mind was a uh, painter, Dan Naminha, who uh, uh, Hopi Indian uh, artist in Santa Fe who told me that he routinely paints to my recordings. I said, well, gee, that's great. So this idea came about, and uh, very fortunate to have these uh, really fascinating artists who have all approached music and, and its relation to a, vis a visual impulse in completely different ways. That's why they're all here. So I just want to take a, a moment to go around. I'll, I'll start with Vicki for them to just talk a little bit to place them and their work for you so you can see that relationship. So please, Vicki, tell everybody about your work. Um, well, I basically married a musician. <laughs> 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 so that's how it all started naturally. I, when I was painting, there was music around me, and it was always inspiring me. We, it was from the beginning that way. So one day we decided to put it on stage and let people see the creative process. And we found out that when we do it in front of people, it's a different dimension because it's going to the unsafe. It's not, it's not the same to be alone in a room creating something than to have the energy of the spectac spectator and so, well, that's basically what we do for a few years already. And it's, I feel very blessed to be able to, to share my creative process with amazing artists, amazing musicians. <laughs> Your work has intersected with a, a lot of different disciplines, isn't that right? Yes, uh, that's yeah. another yeah. thing, that I, I like to experiment with different arts. So I do a lot of design. And also I do fashion design. I paint uh, dresses, I create them as a piece of art to wear. So they were exhibited at many galleries throughout the world and in fashion weeks too. <laughs> but, so that's basically what, what I do. And I am interested in also poetry and singing and dancing. So it all comes together and basically it meets somewhere. Do you work in all kinds of time durations, Vicky, in terms of uh, pr painting live w with Gustavo or other musicians? Yes. Any particular time duration? or No. no. Uh, I take it, this moment is what it is, <laughs> like this. I take it like that way. So whatever the result is, is the painting, because mm -hmm. that's the emotion and the, mm -hmm. the 
energy of the moment, and that's what I want people to see, the, what, the way that music affects me during painting. Mm. And there, and you can see. Mm -hmm. Gustavo, talk a little bit about your work. Yeah. About my work. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm also a kind of chameleon. I do a little bit of everything. And, but always, luckily, it was always music. The only thing I did in my life is to something related to music. And I hope it stays like that. And I started like uh, more with classical music. Then I went, like, in, when I was a teenager, I went into jazz. And then when I came to, by, by the way, we are from Uruguay. Everyone knows where is Uruguay. Mm -hmm. We did very good in soccer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, the, the music from Uruguay is tango, tango and candombe. And, but actually, I didn't have that when I heard, you know, it's the music from my country, and I, li I grew up there. But I didn't have it like I was a jazz musician. And I was thinking, what, what, what's going on? I just it's from a different place. Actually, I live half of my life in this country. So and I'm immersed in a jazz world. But since I arrived here, I started rediscovering where are my roots. And I don't like to describe my music, but really it's like a mixture. I would say classical music, tango, and jazz, those are the biggest influences. And then what happened in 2005, this interaction with, uh, with painting, I mean, the most weird thing was to be working with my wife on stage. <laughs> but it had a great, it was, that was like the, the biggest punch, the uh, thing that punched me. And but obviously, the, the artistic part, it opened up like a different dimension on every sense. Not only like I had, I started thinking even the way how to sell a show. Because you know, we musicians, we, we do a lot of stuff to try to put our music out, and it's not easy. It's not easy. So by doing this and started adding like, I actually discovered this with her, that by adding uh, more artistic flavors and from different disciplines, we can create something different, actually, that, that can really mix like the music with the other arts. And it was incredible. The, you know, we did it like in, in different formats. Once it was like all improvised, but we also tried it, you know, like something to play, uh, to paint over all written music. And that is like a different, different kind of vibe. But uh, it's great also, it's a great experience. And I'm, what I like most is actually this. In this case, what I don't like is that I don't see the paintings. But you know, I could try to play like that. <laughs> you know, because the idea is that we get inspired from each other. And if she, yes, it's a real conversation between both arts. If she paints something, she starts like with red. I wouldn't say, some people say they say there's a direct uh, relation between the exact color with the pictures. I don't go exactly into that, but I do know that I think in terms of colors, even when, I, when I'm teaching, I'm, I teach about, uh, in composition, I teach colors. I always speak about colors because for me, when I'm composing or improvising, I do see colors. And perhaps if there is something very light, like going up there, it will suggest like a general color vibe and I am thinking in that way, I'm feeling in that way. And I guess what we do here, it gets connected. And the other uh, point she was saying about the audience, that also brings another dimension, that when, I, when, when you're doing this at home. So that's basically it. Yeah, <laughs> More well, that's, or less. that's great, thank you. <laughs> Marty, talk about some of your work, yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I think I'll start out first with just being a little bit of the uh, um, is a devil's advocate or something and say that in many ways music and the visual, let's say painting, have the least in common of all the arts. And I think the primary reason for that um, is that you see a, a, a piece of art and it's finished that you see it all at once. But music and dance and the written word happen through time. And I just wanted to throw that out. Um, I don't know if it explains, but for me, in many ways, the visual arts have been the least involved of any of the art forms for me. 
for whatever reason, I, I started out improvising with poets, and I've done a lot of improvising with dancers, hundreds and hundreds of hours in live performance and just some workshop. Um, but having said all that, and I'm not here to just wanted to point that out, I think that's just something about what I understand. Um, I have had this long relationship with one particular painter that I met when I was in high school. Um, and uh, it did lead to this shared work. And notice I'm not even calling it a collaboration, because I'm not sure we collaborated, which is sort of interesting. <laughs> um, we never did this, for example, um, which is uh, not a value judgment. But um, anyway, I grew up in St. Louis real briefly. There was an artist collective called the Black Artist Group, which was a group of black artists um, who were very much into self-defining their own direction at the beginning of the 60s. Um, it was very political. It was very concerned with new directions in individual expression. And it also involved all the art forms. And uh, as I sort of became befriended by some of these artists, one was this painter, Oliver Jackson, who um, I kept a long friendship with. And over the years, um, he always said, if you ever want to use, I said, you know, I love your paintings, Oliver. There's something in them that moves me, that grabs me. And he was also someone I talked with. Uh, though Oliver did not like to talk about shared artistic processes. In fact, he was sort of, we don't do that. He would talk, maybe you, you had to finally tell him that you had to sleep when it came to talking about music. That's all he wanted to talk about, very much like what you all have said. Painters are very close to music. It's incredible how involved they are with music at times. To make a long story short, I began using his paintings as the cover of my various CDs. I'll just hold these up. By the way, size is such a thing. CDs are so lousy. I mean, LPs at least were something. Remember, you sat there, you had the nice picture, you sat on your sofa. Charlie Parker's playing the Chicago Symphony, Nina Simone, you're looking at the big picture. And now we're reducing this. Oliver's paintings are all at least the size of this entire wall, or the majority of that wall. He works in very large things. So anyway, a quick nice story. So for 10 years, I've been using his paintings. And I'm playing actually at the Guggenheim out in their thing. And this guy comes up to me and says, I just got a job as a curator at Harvard. They just hired me, and the first thing I want to do is to bring you and Oliver Jackson to Harvard to work together. Because um, he was a huge fan of Oliver's, who lives in Oakland, California, and he liked my music. So we were there for 10 weeks, and we had neighboring studios. And um, we ended up doing what ended up being was that I, he made these six full paintings. This is one of them. Uh, I'm sorry, here's another. <laughs> here's a picture of the two of us. We sort of spoofed on like the Whistler's thing. I had him hold up his, just his white roller, even though that's not what he painted with. Anyway, you can barely see. But anyway, um, and I had the room next to him. And I did at times go and play my saxophone while he painted. Uh, I can't tell that it had absolutely any effect on his painting at all. But the point is we have had a 40-year dialogue. And it ended up with that the show was up, put up and for six months, my final piece played for eight hours wow. in this gallery. And the thing that really made me happy was that um, we were curious about this. And they said that it, the, the, at the end, they sort of did a bit of a study that people stayed two to three times longer because the music was there. Um, and I wrestled a lot with this idea that when you walked in, you saw all six of his paintings in their completeness. But you might, I wrote 60 minutes of music. You walked in at minute 23 and a third. So I had no control over development, uh, resolution, all the elements that a composer has. You shape a piece. Um, so I had a, some difficult aesthetic decisions to make, and, and I wrestled with that. Eventually, what I ended up fighting for <laughs> and getting from Fair Harvard was um, I said, you know, his paintings don't look to me like solo saxophone. And I eventually got the opportunity for the first time in my life to bring um, 23 musicians, some of the, some of my really, the creme de la creme, or just all of them creative artists I knew. I said, I need, I, I need people to paint with me. 
And I uh, had two days in the recording studio and ended up writing um, this six-movement work called The Long View, and um, which was... So in a sense, I, did the, I wrote the music, but I really did the music after spending time with him. Um, and the CD came out. I have a bunch of them here. And that's what I ended up doing, writing for a very large ensemble using different approaches. Um, one last quick story that I thought was very interesting. So here I've always loved Oliver's paintings. They speak to me viscerally in a way that maybe not all visual stuff has. And um, so he starts painting, and I, really, you know, I see that he paints on the ground. As you know, often people build, who work in large spaces do paint on the <laughs> floor. And it was interesting because he spent three days just preparing with the white thing. And he, I, one day I said, Oliver, I've got nothing to do. Let me think of, nope, <laughs> this has to be done exactly purpose, you know, very fastidious. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm in there. He starts painting, little this and that, and it makes no sense to me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. Either I'm losing it or he's losing it or something. And, you know, because I'm not saying anything. And I'm just sitting there. I, I would check in periodically. I'd go back to my room. I, I'd be, I was composing. And on about the fourth day, Harry Cooper, who was the curator, walked in to do his studio visit. And he walks in, and Oliver's there around his great big thing. And I'd always had sat in the same chair and um, looking at it. And Harry, first thing out of his mouth was, OK, where's the bottom of the painting? And well, it was over there. I go, wow, it's on the ground. And I had no idea where the bottom was. So then I went and stood over there. And of course, it started to make total sense to me. <laughs> so we um, really, to me, this was a, a very involved. I hope it was, I think it pushed me to creative heights I never had been. And I, I think he did amazing paintings. Um, it really questioned a lot of what is the processes in these. Um, and it was a tremendous experience. And uh, as is this, so. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Rebecca, talk a little bit about, about your relationship with music. Well, first, I just want to thank Jane and, and the Philoctity Center for inviting me to participate. This has been fun to think about and to get ready for. Um, Jane, you and I met when you came out to Seattle. Jane was giving a concert at Cornish College of the Arts where my partner, Laura Kaminsky, the composer, oh. and I were, were working at the time. And we just had a great time. And that was about seven or eight years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that painting is about cultivating the freedom to love. And composing and performing is also that. That to love one's work, to love the world, to love oneself is um, serious work. And for me, painting and listening to music and trying to appreciate all of the com levels of commitment that are involved in making something from scratch lead us to a greater capacity to love. When Vicky was talking about going, performing on stage and the, the sort of risk-taking involved in that, anyone who is making something new from the material of one's life is taking a risk and making commitments that are very difficult to assume. And so when I think about my experience with music, it really began with listening to music in concert halls and chamber music settings and people's houses in my own studio, and beginning with just drawing the musicians, making sketches directly from observation. And, and over the years, I've made a lot of sketchbooks that are filled with musicians performing. And the first thing that I started to become aware of when I was drawing these musicians was the energy that was required to prepare for a performance and to be in the midst of a performance. And I tried in my own way, as I was drawing those musicians, to capture the intensity and commitment of their work. Um, and so I... I began a journey of getting to know 
the Emerson String Quartet, um, and other individual musicians through watching them and drawing them as they worked. And to experience their performance in that way helped me to, to really delve into the music at a deeper level. Um, so I've done this for years and years and years, and I have a lot of sketchbooks filled with drawings of musicians that you and I have, have all watched and listened to performing. Um, two years ago, I created a series of 40 small paintings. Some of them are behind me here that are painted through the inspiration of individual musicians who I either know or are part of my life in some way. And Jane is included in this series. I think she's out front here, <laughs> one of these, the yellow and blue. <laughs> and can you hold it up? Hold, hold it up for <laughs> How far can I go with this? Here she is. Oh. Um, and these are abstract paintings, and they're really miniatures. But what I tried to do in this series was to compress the experience of thinking about each individual musician within um, a small world of a painting. And so the, the musicians that I selected were all either musicians that I know or who've been a part of my life in the studio through listening to recordings of their work. And that became, um, that became a kind of uh, essential practice for me over that period of two years. So I would just say that in music and painting, there is a kind of reciprocity of understanding and exchange. And that when I listen to music, it helps me to enter a world of make-believe and emptiness that is essential for my own ability to make something new from nothing, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it occurs to me that one of the differences in process here is the artists are creating in their own environment solo. Yeah. The three musicians uh, performing here today have never performed or played with each other before, and we're creating something simultaneously as a trio. So maybe it occurs to me, uh, and, and if you, you would be up for doing this. Uh, I'm up for it. Okay. <laughs> How about we're going to do a few, a few mini improvisations, but I think it might be interesting. Why don't we let uh, Gustavo, so, a solo piece, uh, paint, paint to it. And then uh, we'll ask Marty to do a solo piece. Yeah, paint as you wish. Uh, but Marty will do a solo piece. I'll do a little solo. And then uh, we'll play together again. Okay. Yeah. You want to start, Martin? So, I think whatever. Short um, poses. Short poses. Short yeah. poses. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the same thing. I've struggled my whole life to be able to play. I, I, real, I can't play with my eyes open very well. I can't improvise with my eyes open. Um, so... I don't mean that by any form of disrespect. And I actually have tried to practice at home to see if I could pull it off, but my eyes shut. So I will be here in spirit with all of you, but I, I find I concentrate best with my eyes closed. I can try closed. painting with my eyes closed. And you can paint with your eyes closed, which is automatic painting. People have, yeah. But it's, it's purely just a form of whatever, how I do it.
very hard to talk, <laughs> play and talk. Uh, inter uh, interesting. Uh, synesthesia? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I never had uh, coloristic, a specific coloristic connection uh, in my brain about, about uh, playing music. But yet I do feel this sense of a, a sculptural sense of, of creating sound in space. Um, I, uh, maybe Ed can help me. Uh, the neuroscience uh, Ramachandran, who did the famous uh, cross-cultural study uh, showing two figures, uh, the made, a made-up la uh, made language, uh, a figure with a rounded shape, you know, an abstract shape, but with rounded curves, and another shape with angles. And he said, one is Kiki and one is Boo Boo. And he went all over the world, different cultures, asking people, which one is Kiki and which one is Boo Boo? <laughs> and he was looking for the connection between you know, language and visual input. And I've, I forget the percentage, but it's, it was pretty pretty compelling that all around the world, the one that went that's Kiki. <laughs> this one is Boo Boo. <laughs> um, that's language. It's a, a step in the brain. Yeah, they're in the brain. They're close. And music, I don't, I'm, I'm hesitant to say uh, when you hear sharp sounds, you play sharp sounds. I think if you looked at what was going on musically and watch the painters, that wasn't what was happening at all. Maybe you guys can chime in because it's not what you think. <laughs> it's, not what you think. It's, it's not illustration, mm -hmm. no, for me. Um, again, it, it really is music as a passageway to a sense of uh, openness and vibrancy and um, when Gustavo was playing, I started to have fun for the first time in the last 25 minutes. Um, and it, it, it is this kind of, of, of desire to, to, to be in a state of play. And play is a very sophisticated form of work, in my view. Children, for children, play is evidence. When children can play well, it's evidence of good health, I think. And for adults to play well, which is so much a part of why we make art, um, requires a dropping away of things, a dropping away of self-consciousness, for example. So thinking about coming here was a, was a very self-conscious experience for me because I've never, other than in teaching experiences where I'm demonstrating, I've never worked in this context. But I really wanted to. I really wanted to because I respect Jane so much. And so that's what I felt. Yeah. Well, either we can't, as artists, we can't talk about the specificity of the results of how the two interact in our minds, you can see. <laughs> uh, Vicky, please talk, talk about that. I am terrible talking, but I think I talk a lot with my painting, you know? Like, and with your hands. This is what I, and with, with your hands. hands. <laughs> but, but what I feel, I feel. That's what I do, you know, when I am painting. So I think it's a channeling of emotions into the canvas that the the music or whatever form of art provokes in you, it's, it goes through you and channels into the, you splash it in. Right. That's the way I, I feel about it. And also I was thinking that the difference between music and, and, and painting is that you are playing in a certain order. In this moment, everybody can see the order I am the order I am putting uh, the composition together, no? in which order I am doing it. And you were talking also. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, it's a real interesting yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so, good or bad, it's just what it is. In a museum, you don't see the order of this composition, how it was displayed. Yeah. In this case, you see it, but that's, that's a big difference between music and, and painting. 
but it's also connected there. Mm, very interesting. <laughs> I guess because one funny, interesting thing also about painting, I mean, you can see, I don't know, I look at that painting, and how long it took to do that. And I guess it could be in hand also sometimes of the style. Not really, but for example, for doing something figurative that is clearly, you know, everything like right on place. I, it's probably that didn't take, uh, I don't know, like two hours. Or perhaps it did, but it's, it's more, it's harder. You know what my point where I'm going to? Mm -hmm. that. Perhaps in abstract, however in abstract, it can take also, it can take weeks to finish an abstract painting, or sometimes it could be very fast also, and take like in live performance, like real time, like whatever, you start from here to here, like in an hour and a half, you yeah. finish the painting. Now when we see an abstract painting, who knows how long it took? Right. And I don't know, does it change, is it different, like a painting that took three months to finish to something is does it have more value uh -huh. I, I think there's the value is different on each painting and but it's interesting to see this relation of time that you don't know as, as the audience you're looking at the painting okay how long it took to do that yeah. and if you knew it took 10 minutes would you say okay that has less value than this one because a, a painting that took three months to make, and it's also abstract. I guess in composition, it could be, there is an analogy there also with, I mean, if you're writing a, an arrangement for a big band or a symphonic orchestra or something that you really have to, you can hear, if you have a sense of music, you hear, oh, everything is arranged, that goes here, the flute goes with that one. So it's a lot, I mean, can you do that in one hour? Obviously not. Mm -hmm. And in improvisation, you do it right on the spot. Now, if you get all the orchestra together, can they improvise everything on the spot? Yeah. Like, one to, uh, no. So, yes. But in terms of the duration of time and, and, and its relationship to the value of a work or the duration of time in an improvisatory exchange uh, uh, among musicians, a painting that takes 15 minutes, let's say, and is a successful painting and has inner logic, take, takes 15 minutes and 25 years. Exactly. And an impro yes. improvised work that, 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 that finds an inner logic among mm -hmm. the musicians or within the musician, him or herself, took eight minutes and 20 years. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I, I just I find myself trying to find ways to talk about... Um, this dilemma of, of spontaneity and discipline mm -hmm. and how each of those, it, they're, they're twins in terms of the working process. And I'm always curious about composers and performers in terms of how they experience the, the, the finding of that, of that inner logic, that gravity within a performance or a particular work that they're composing. Because I think that's something that we all strive for, all of us who are involved in generative work. You know, I think in music, um, especially, again, if you are composing it, using notation to have it be interpreted later, that is one of the real things. How do you feel it through time? And I always like the story that Stravinsky um, would often make his scores. He'd use colored pencils because he'd use col different colors for different themes, different emotions, all the stuff we're talking about. And not only that, he liked to take his scores and hang them around an entire room so that he physically, and I'm imagining him counting off the tempos and walking through, let's say, the Rite of Spring. Right walking around the room. So he turned this abstraction of notation, which is a lot about sound moving through time, he turned it into as close as he could get to a physical and visual. I've got to tell you a fascinating story. <laughs> you hung with me. <laughs> no, no. When I was in high school, I remember being asked by a, a music theory teacher to analyze, uh, you know, a classical piece, and I loved the Rite of Spring. That was for me. That was it. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Oh, it was a, oh, it was fantastic. And I remembered the way I did the analysis. I did a graphic 
There you go. Score of the layers of sounds that I could hear in Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. I don't know what the heck I ever did with it, but it was visual, and it was not like, well, we're moving to the subdominant here. It wasn't anything like that. I, I drew something imagistic that, to my ear, felt like, and I'm, believe me, I'm not a, a painter or anything, but wow, that's yeah. fascinating, something connected. Uh, you know, another... Um, <laughs> Just yeah. one direct art form, I think, we, we worth mentioning. Um, and it, if you remember Bill Evans, the pianist, wonderful yeah. liner notes to Kind of Blue, because mm-hmm. he connected what happened that day in making of that now very iconic record to Zen, to Japanese brush painting done on paper, because he said this is a visual, it's an actual, and help me out, painters, because the brush can very easily break the paper, yeah. and it has to be the motion, and that tends to be the painting. It parallels a little bit making music in time because it's a form that can only happen in a short amount of time. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. as you were saying, took the 25 years of yeah. daily work to make the one brush stroke. So he, he drew that comparison. Um, one thing about that recording kind of blue, which is an interesting thing, and not, is that Miles Davis did not give the music to mm-hmm. the musicians as great as they were, Bill Evans, Sean Coe, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't see that music till they got in the recording studio, which was not at all the practice of the time. So in many ways, he was, I think, in tune with that idea. Well, yeah, we, we've talked at other, other periods of times about improvisers being spontaneous composers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when the compositional process, for me, as, a, as an improvising musician thinker, when the compositional process is really happening for me is when I'm tapped into something that feels very much like my improvising. I feel a very strong connection between the two things. And I feel like they're best when, they are, when they're flowing together. Um, as opposed to thinking of uh, the, the extended thought process of the composition being uh, uh, so far, far away from my spontaneous experience. I, I think my compositional work is the most successful when it draws from something very strong from my improvisational vocabulary. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you one quick demonstration. Uh, uh, this piece, I remember it years ago, uh, was Jackson Pollock inspired, uh, came from a very fluid improvisation one day and here it is, I don't know how many years later it's come into this form piece goes but that very much it you can I'm a, I'm a saxophone player you can hear it where it comes from <laughs> yeah it, I, the motion feels visceral to me yeah, yeah. yeah. Jane yeah perhaps I mean, perhaps the audience are also asking the movement thing mm-hmm. that I mean it's unusual you don't see it in every player perhaps you want to talk a little bit of that is that connected visually somehow with anything um I've always moved when I played. I never used to think about it. As years went by, I, I hung out a lot with modern dancers. <laughs> uh, got to think more conscientiously about it and got very interested in how sound changes when it moves. Uh, and <laughs> we, we talked at, at, at a different uh, seminar where I mentioned uh, I grew up near the, the sound of uh, Route 128 in Boston. <laughs> And I have a feeling that the drone of that at night. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think there's some connection. <laughs> Something very primal. Were you watching the cars? <laughs> no, no, no. I was in the burbs, but I could. I remember that sound like it was like a comforting sound. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that that movement aspect has been for me. Uh, the center point for something I've developed as a composer, both uh, in large forms and small forms of composition. Anywho, uh, shall we play together? Sure. Yeah. Yeah.
let's uh, just for this, we're going to do a series of mini improvisations for you, and we, maybe we'll talk in between. Uh, so we're thinking. Okay. Maybe uh, I'll, we'll set little, uh, like, as if this were our test kitchen. This one? <laughs> our, our test kitchen. Food uh, the, the Food Network. Let's just say the only thing we're going to set among the musicians is that we are all going to start simultaneously. Okay? That's it. Simultaneous. <laughs> I had a real visual thought, <laughs> um, which is one of the main things you think about in composing, whether it's done through notation by yourself in a room that you hand to someone, or like we just did, you think a lot about foreground and background. Like, you know, sometimes yeah. taking a supporting role. And I was thinking sometimes taking a lead role. You know, if you tell, like, I thought, you know, you started that quarter note thing. So yeah. uh, both Jane and I sort of joined it sort of within the texture, and sometimes it came out. and. And I know we'll see in these a sense of that, too. So that's very visual, right? I mean, well, the, I love foreground, said, background. I but love what you just said about foreground and background because it was happening just now. And um, it's also something that I listen for in Debussy. And in the, the, mm -hmm. the layers of, of the chromatic layers of sound that are experienced totally viscerally, like Jane was talking about the physical aspects. But what just happened for me was just this huge burst of pleasure in those sounds as they came together. And that translates as energy hmm. to, to keep 
thinking and keep working and keep concentrating. Artists don't always, uh, I mean, musicians, I, I can't speak for artists, but musicians don't always play mood, if you know what I mean. As a matter of fact, it's a word I don't, I don't use at all. Huh. Uh, it's, it's more as if uh, perhaps there is something that, that is more akin to color about uh, a feeling for the contrast of sounds as they exist next to each other, with each other, in front of each other, behind each other. Yeah, spatialness. Uh, uh, something that we do as compositional thinkers, as improvisers. Um, so it's not always, uh, here's a quiet passage and everybody <laughs> plays quiet. <laughs> nor is it everybody's playing la. It's, it, there's something more complex about the decision-making process that's going on about why you play something and not something else. Mm. Why one color, not another? I don't know. <laughs> um, I want to add something. For me, like, I think also like the harmonic considerations, it takes part like, on my decisions also, and that is a lot very visual also at least for me in my conception my musical conception when I think of the level of dissonance and like if you play something really out or something more inside I mean it's hard to say with words because it's really something abstract that I get I guess it gets together in a way with the grading of the of the colors also there and on the decisions okay tones. should I put yeah the tones and yeah. should I put more dissonance or should I put more tension there and I don't know exactly how, what's the relation I don't know if there is a mathematical relation perhaps there is I don't know uh, yeah or psychological Psychological or whatever, but probably I'm not aware, I'm not, as I said before, I'm not thinking, okay, this color, you know, although sometimes to me, for example, the Phrygian mode, I, for me, suggests always yellow, a kind of yellow, dark. Could you, not, I'm sorry, the, could you play a Phrygian mode? Yes. Yeah. And of course, it depends also how you play when you go like, when you go something like that, if, if it's very. I don't know, like cloudy sound, you would imagine also the dynamic of the plane would affect what you think. But I'm talking about the, the, and, uh, the color itself, and it appears more when, when I'm composing. I say, okay, should it go there? Okay. Or like freezing colors. I don't know, for me that, that's kind of, it's a jazz yellow. But you know, it, perhaps it's played here. I don't know if that's yellow, perhaps yellow with, with a blinking light. Brighter yellow. Brighter yellow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm not sure if there is an exact uh, like relation, but it definitely there is something. There is something. The same way you were actually you were saying to me, like joking, let's go C7 sharp 11. You said, for me, that as a fourth mode of melodic minor, these are musical terms, that always suggested to me kind of bluish stuff. You know, when it, that's when I'm writing something. I said, okay, let's go to that color. You know, let's open it up because each, let's say, each mode or each color that I have in my palette when I'm composing, I really see them like colors. I'm writing a melody that I can reharmonize. I say, let me put some more open, open color or more brilliant color, and I would go to that there. And that's like brighter in a way than this one. And it's not only on the way of playing, it's not just, if I do the same here. I mean, for me, that's light, even with the same dynamic, it's a different color related to harmony, but it's brighter color. For me, that's bluish, but I don't know. I want to add something. Yes. Talking about dynamics, for me, this painting is completely different because I never do this of <laughs> play music, stop, Oh, yeah. Talk and then go back to the painting. So very odd. It's going to be a completely different dynamic for me. The yeah. result of the composition, no? It's for sure different. Yeah. I have a quick question yes. for Gustavo. When you think of up, Gustavo, which direction do you think of? When I think of what? Up. 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 Yeah. On on you know musically up. When you think musically going higher in pitch. Yeah. You mean. If I think this is up you, or this you, is down? Do you think to the right is, is higher in pitch? <laughs> no, just that's mechanically here. That's just mechanical. Oh, no, no, no way, no way. I, you know, I play also mostly close eyes, like always, mm -hmm. I think. It's, and I'm not with the eyes closed. And 
No, I'm not here. Obviously, you're more here. <laughs> and I mean, I try to be there. And I think that's a great thing that it really happens with, uh, with improvisation. I, I'm in a different mood when I play, play something completely written. And I do concerts, all written music. And then I do concerts, some written and some improvisation. And really, the ones I like the most are the ones that there's nothing written. And I, just, and I do that a lot, actually. I, and I try to force myself to put piano solo concert. I have no clue what I'm going to play. And try to take it to the extreme. And when you get there, in a way, I think it's easier to, to be in that. You're floating. There's no up, down, and... Well, there is, in a sense, right? You know when you go up or down, but I don't know if physically to the right or to the left, I wouldn't... I don't know how Marty feels, but I, because I play a woodwind instrument, where it, my visualization of keys and the higher I... I think of up this way. I've met pianists who think of up that way. <laughs> in pitch. I'm talking up in pitch. When I think up in pitch, I have a visual sense of going this way, because that's how this horn works. And it, it, it's just a visual physicalness of a very strong attachment to a, an instrument that feels body-like to me, you know. And I'm sure to a pianist, you know, that, you know, way up high, right, that, that is a physical connection, too. I know. I, I just, was I, not thinking about that. Yeah. that, Jane. Uh, that makes me think a lot about de Kooning, because mm-hmm. when, when he, he was working, you would often see him turning... The orientation of the canvas or the paper paper was not fixed until it was fixed until it was decided upon, and this this idea of of, of choosing what is up and what is down, right and left, um, how that happens for a painter, I think, is also very dynamic. Was it Marty who was talking about your friend Oliver who yeah, worked on the I floor? Was, mm-hmm, he definitely from had above. this idea, and I, it helped me when I found out what his idea was. Yeah. But, but the way that we experience what we're working on physically in terms of looking and where we stand and where we sit and are we above it and are we to the side of it, sometimes I'll be in the studio working on this painting and looking at this painting and, say, and all of a sudden saying, oh, that's what that needs, but I'm really working on this. But, the, but I think all of us can benefit from becoming more aware of, of orientation, where is up, where is and down, where is down, especially when it has to do with our peripheral vision, because we, we don't use that enough. And we can really see so much further beyond where we think we can see or hear. Yeah, what I do is I don't usually decide which way until it's done. <laughs> Yeah, I turn it and turn it and turn it. And, and then, you know. and then yeah. when it's done, I look at it and I can keep changing a painting over and over. It can be a hundred paintings in one painting, but sometimes cool. I yeah. painted it one way and then and do you, I find do you out that it's... you know for sure after you turn it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Then, then there's something oh, yeah, in your mind yeah. that tells you yeah, this is the way it should yes. be. And how, yeah. how do we define yes. what the heck that is? <laughs> I don't know. That reminds me of something This. Um, it happened. We've been uh, doing this together since 2005. We've been doing a show, painting music show with Vicky, and it's funny because we were talking with the audience, you know, after the show, and many people were telling us, especially with the painting, you know, because, and she used to, she paints like huge, like all that wall, you know, like, oh, crazy. Now you see her like sitting down, <laughs> and she goes, you know, like wild, and, and the thing is the. You see that the, the audience are saying, oh, did you see that cow there? And it was great when you painted the cow or the horse. And Vicky goes like, what? <laughs> and it's yeah, a, during the process. They also tell me, why did you cover up the woman? <laughs> and I was like, and what? What woman? <laughs> Getting yeah. everybody involved in your compositional process can be yeah, very, no, dangerous. It's, yes, very dangerous. It's so, so mm. amazing what people see. And, and that's also something different than with music, because you may, of course, it provokes emotions and everything in the audience, but you make them hear what you want them to hear. Here, they can hear and see whatever they want. It can inspire another kind of music, even if I painted it through jazz, you know, mm-hmm. or with jazz. Uh, another thing is that 
uh, about my painting once I was painting alone in a studio and somebody stopped by and was looking for at me for a while and didn't know me at all and then uh, he came and said you know your painting is very musical he said so I, and then I told him yeah I paint every day with music I am uh-huh. people tell me my, my music is very visual yeah <laughs> very cinematic <laughs> or something <laughs> Where do these words come from? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, trying to put in words something that We're is getting more... getting something. Uh, Everyone just tells me my music sounds Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> tell me. It's very tell me. <laughs> well, you know, we, we've played a bit and talked a bit. You know, are there some thoughts or, the, or questions that you might have that, you know, open it up a little bit? You might have anything you want to ask anybody? Hi, Jill. <laughs> Yes. For instance, I, I didn't see when James playing. I see it in graph or sometimes he has colors and I think it's just in graph or first. But I didn't see maybe you had a little graph. But you were quite contained. Uh, yeah. See, and once you had the beginnings of your framework, you didn't destroy it too much. You worked from it and you deepened it. Yeah. And maybe the intensity that I see is a key instead of the movement. Yeah, well, in terms of lines, I see curves and straight lines or sharpened <coughs> things like that. But I think I, I destroyed a little bit. Maybe you didn't see, but, but I went over the beginning. Uh, it changed quite a bit the lines. Of course, I, am, I usually paint much bigger, and I can express myself much more through what I am listening to. No? I have something to add to that. Uh, many times we get also this, like the people when they go to see this performance we do, they expect, uh-huh. you know, like a kind of, okay, if she's painting to the music, she ha- actually has to be dancing, you know, ex- and or going to doing the movement. The and that's exactly or, not the idea. It's not the it is to, to whatever, to receive whatever she receives by music and translate it in that. What does happen is that she does it anyway. Naturally, you, we see the videos, you know, and she sometimes, you know, we go with the whole band like like one big trope, you know, and she goes like that, you know, and she hears. Sometimes it happens naturally, but we yeah. try to avoid like it's this is not a choreography since it's like you know we're trying to be truth to ourselves. So whatever comes, you know, and so I think you were talking about that. Like, it doesn't have to be, this is weird, because it's music and painting, so it's not the same thing. They are related, but it doesn't mean that if we are going like, like that, that she has to be going like, no, perhaps it translates in a completely Um, different way. Yeah, sometimes I get that question often, because I am very passive, actually. Passive, you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't see me, like, going through the music, like, but... At the end of the of the concert or painting, <laughs> uh, many people can see the whole thing in there. You know, you, you find the rhythms and the or the composition. I don't know. It's like somehow it translates into. But of course, it's very. How do you say? It's there is no preconceptions here, like. It's very free and it's very abstract. So, in a way, I am abstracting a figure of music, deconstructing it. So it translates. It can translate like completely. And in fact, it translates different, different from than. artist to artist. I mean, let me see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to see. Wow, mm. that's great. <laughs> now. This is the same music, but it's not. Yeah, uh, that, it's that's what I'm saying. You, you see, it's two. Each sensibility, each artist has their own yeah. reception and, you know, income and in out, and it comes in a different way. And do you? Right. What do you feel about her question? Because it's the same. Well, I thought that was an interesting question. Um, you were asking about line, the use of line, or or the level of physical activity that you could observe in the painters versus the activity of Mm -hmm. the surface of the canvas. And 
when I'm when I'm making these small paintings, I use a I use a, a stick a lot to scrape through, to do scraffito, scraffito, which is scratching through, and 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 that allows me to unearth color that's underneath the layer that I just painted. So, and I think about that quite consciously. Oh, I wonder what I left behind there. So let's scrape through. Because sometimes the surface of a painting can get very muddy and cloudy, and you want to bring light back into it. So that's a way of using a line and using a very, uh, a, a very sort of direct contour to interrupt the chaos of the gestural work. And line can be a means of creating a kind of stasis or a geometry in a painting. If you think back to 14th century Sienese religious paintings, those, those stories, those narratives are framed through the geometry of the architecture that the painter has incorporated. So I want to look at what Vicky's doing because it, it, the, the whole use, there, there is line there. Yeah. I use a lot of line, always very yeah. structured. Yeah. Structured, but not straight, like geometrically <laughs> yeah. straight or more like flowing. But to lines. make those kinds of lines, if I can assume something about your working process, takes strength and flexibility. They're not, yeah. you're not throwing yourself around. You're I really. Yeah, I am feeling the line. Like a dancer, <laughs> I yeah. Am. I am painting with my whole. And I guess my, it's also a little bit what you said uh -huh. is you were doing this in five minutes, but it's really years mm -hmm. yeah. of preparation for doing that, for doing what you do, for doing. We're all preparing for that five minutes, those also, four, five minutes. Also, in time, again, the time line, you are listening to one note, next to you listen to the other. Here you are seeing one over the other one, and one yeah. over the other one. And yeah. And then it creates something completely different, which also, me as a painter, I look at the composition and I, as, at the same time that I am listening to the music, I am uh, trying to make this composition work. No? I am, at the same time, I, I do it naturally. I am not thinking about it, but it has to have a balance and that the music has along the line, but you don't see it. In each, uh, do I? Uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we also have a retroactive mind in what we play, even in the small pieces. Like we have a, like a theme or something, and actually we went back, like when we started something. At least I, I was. We are playing, and the line, the timeline is moving, but you, you're recalling what you did in a way. You are feeling more than trying to remember what you did. At least I don't know. It happens. I don't know if it works. Sure. Because that's like we're playing really little well. themes, right? And in a way, they are they are seeing what, what happened, and they see it right on the faces, and we see it here, and we feel it. What happened like one minute ago? That you like what, when I started with the quarter notes, or mm -hmm. I, don't, I just remember for example, in the last piece or in the piano so when I played the piano solo, I started something here. I still remember it just went like <laughs> something like that, and that's how it finished. And then I went, yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, um, some of you probably have heard of the musician Butch Morris, who has copyrighted, he does conductions. One of, he's one of many people now try to do these live conductings of improvisers. One of his signs is memory. Now, of course, a composer with notation can bring back that theme that was in the first page and is now, comes back 20 minutes later. He asks the people live, and... As you're saying, Gustavo, of course, we do it somewhat cog somewhat um, consciously, somewhat unconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one thing here, because I know a lot of us all teach, and I think we probably would all want to say to any of our uh, young people trying, who are really into the arts, like, you want to understand all the arts. They're, they are all related. And at the same time, understand what's what, they're, what they can do really, how they're put together. It's, it's both surely a, you know, a theoretical, historical, political, spiritual, all the whatever, psycho, analytical, any, any of the above. 
And um, I think really one of the best ways to do that is to do stuff like we're doing, because yeah. you have to like see what works. Uh, separate from the idea that the finished work is somehow a representation of the process. That is another thing. Mm -hmm. Please. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to see, um, it, it, it inspires me to think of the musicians working off painters in yeah. some way of reversing the process and I'm just playing with, with yeah. you know, well, talking about the painting. Graphic sports. How, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could see, you know, there, there being colors flashed on or textures Definitely. and have the, the painters responding to it and have the music respond to it mm -hmm. and then just mixing it up in all kinds of ways. It's hard for us to. Yeah, that's what I said. The first thing. I should, you know. Here's a thought. Would it work? I'm not saying today, yeah. and give an opinion. What if it wasn't done simultaneously, but there was an audience where there was 10 minutes of music, and then the painters painted for 20 yeah. minutes by themselves, and the music happened? Yes. yes. That'd be yeah, that's an interesting what experiment. That was. Yeah. Please, yeah. Um, I'm Beverly Ruth Bader, and I'm the painter. And I find whenever I walk into the studio, especially. Um, when I start a blank canvas, but most always, the music, as you're working with color and form, and as you're imagining how to make your painting alive, the music helps you dance. Yes. It, it enables you to feel the music as part of the painting. It's almost like you don't know that the music and the painting are separate because they dance together. And the form becomes alive with the music. If I have no music, then I lose my self-consciousness um, uh, to a point where I need a little self-consciousness to become aware of the thinking and the feeling together. You can't be two of either. And so the music is such a great balance, and it helps you not worry. I find, you know, how you worry sometimes. What's going on with this painting? Well, the music lifts me, and it helps me deal with the questions I have to ask about the composition. So they really dance together. For me, looking at painting is the same thing about self-consciousness, about music. It puts me in that other space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a relaxed place. Yeah. It's like, it's like relaxed place. to me, it helps me reach that meditation, that I, that state of meditation that I need to be creative. And what another thing about your question is that um, it may not? I I may be in a show with him, and I may be ten minutes just lose, listening to the music, because I don't need to be painting each note like. You know, I, I just need that to come into my soul, and then I am going to show you what I feel, <laughs> if right. you can see it. <laughs> like no, last it's like, or you will interpret. I mean, I'm like... Kidding. Yeah. I wanted to say thank you so much for what you did for the Ruth Bader Congratulations on that new discovery. I've been obsessed with this subject for a lifetime. And I, I just wanted to say that, you know, to provide a, maybe a little background places to go, I'm looking at this, that Aldous Huxley, the writer, was 80% blind as a teenager. He could only read through Braille. So he wrote a book in 1943 called The Art of Seeing. He talks about visual literacy and visual education. You can find it on Amazon, which is connected with the Bates method, what's called behavioral optometry. That they've been looking at these ideas, the Da Vinci minds that are like buried in that area over there. The leading place in the United States is the SUNY College of Optometry on 42nd Street, believe it or not. They've been looking at this stuff for like 80, 90 years. So it's a wonderful resource. And I just have to say that Carl Jung said everything is image, and that it unfortunately might take 600 years for the rest of the world to catch on to that. That the way the brain is wired, meaning and understanding is visual nature. That's why you say, I see what you mean. I engage my imagination. But the question, to just use your words, to riff off of these two things, is that in the Old Testament, 3,000 years ago, the references to synesthesia, they say they heard the images and saw the sounds, what that means to you. And also in the Hindu tradition, they say resonance, sound, is what produces light. 
And I'm just curious, when you want to experience those two things, what that means to you, what you might have to say about that. Well, myself? It's funny, I always refer to Vicky as, when I think, you know, we're going for a gig, you know, we're doing our show, and for me she's one more musician. And I tell her, so uh, when are you playing? You're playing here, you know, and she's, it's part of the music, and it's really like, she's one more of the band. That's great. And so when I, when I see, how was your phrase? <laughs> I hear. They, they saw the sounds and heard it. They saw this idea to see the sounds, you know, and and it's, it's exactly we. I live with that. I will live. I live with that. <laughs> I want to thank everybody. A, a, Sorry. A, a, quickly, because we have to finish up. Yeah. A question about the choice of the music. For instance, the artist mentioned playing music, and um, my understanding, all right, he was husband and wife, we must be working together. So you must know a little bit of what to expect or the kind of music he plays. How did you react? How did you find out? You were building up the sound and then working with musicians. You never worked with people who were playing. Did you find yourself reaching to music who were really surprised with? Yeah. Uh, rather than than thinking about him as a as my husband, I would say that play, playing I am saying yeah, playing yeah, jazz. Play. <laughs> For me, uh, painting to jazz, to jazz, it's it's a completely different painting for me because it's so free and. I felt very comfortable with them because I am very used to jazz and to the to the language in my colors, no? I, I, I am not a musician in no sense, you know, but I am connected to that, not because of him, but because jazz, I don't know, it touches me in some way that it opens up my creativ creativity. Uh, Huh? Really mostly jazz, not classical. Mostly jazz. We, I paint also to classical and to any kind of music. I, I put in my studio, I listen to everything. But, uh, for example, we also do this with tango. And the tango music is com a completely different feeling of the painting. Like the result and, you can and the see composition the, the different, is completely yeah, it's a different. different painting. It's, <laughs> and as I was saying before, uh, this was jazz, but very cut, like tango, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because tango it's has a, a beginning and an, and That's an end. That's what they say about tango. Jazz can mm. go through flowing, and, and it gives me a completely different composition. I, I'm afraid we have to finish up, but I, I, I just want to say thank you. Can you play one more? Oh, you want, uh, Ed wants one more. <laughs> oh, okay, we have to end up. <laughs> Try what you suggested. Excuse me. Oops, oh, I can't do that. that. Me too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> we can unplug now, probably. Can we unplug? Yes. Yeah, still plugged in.
Gustavo Casanave, Marty Ehrlich, Rebecca Allen. Wow. 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 <laughs>